Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> a familiar passage that I want to deal with here today. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh. Please note it didn't say the flesh. But his flesh. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Would you say amen to the reading of God's Word? You may be seated this morning. I will quickly say that I have, I know sometimes a couple of series going on at the same time. I do that in my personal life. I have two or three books I'm reading all at one time. and uh, But uh, sometimes too, I have different crowds at the church. My Sunday morning crowd is not my Wednesday night crowd. And I have to sometimes take that into consideration when I'm preaching. And uh, so I, I want to say to you that right now on Wednesday nights, I think the, what I just begun this last Wednesday night, only going to probably be two, three sermons. We're going to try to really keep it to that about this idea of uh, um, uh, not really going to be dealing with not allowing emotions to overcome us and, and having a proper order in our life of spirit, soul, and body. We're, going to be, we're dealing with that. This afternoon, God willing, we're going to go back and dealing with this business of Christian perfection and what that means in our life. And that will take us a, a, a few lessons. And I, and I want to share here this morning. I, just, I was standing last Sunday morning as we were worshiping the Lord. And God just brought this passage to my mind and, 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 and led me to go back here. And I'm thinking, Lord, is this where I need to go or go somewhere else? And I just hear that voice again and again. No, stay with it here. And I found out that God knows more than I know a long time ago. But... But sometimes we just still think we know better. We will argue and, and ah, I think the people need this. And God says, no, they need this. So we're going to preach some things here about this business of uh, sowing to the Spirit. And I want to talk about sowing to the Spirit. And, but I, I want to deal with it in its context. And this morning what I want to do is I want to just talk a little bit from this, these verses of Scripture themselves. Talk about some of the meanings of the words and, and just share a little bit some principles about that, the Scripture itself. And then in the context of it, we'll be going back to Galatians, the context of this letter that Paul has written. We're going to talk about how that so into the flesh and so into the Spirit is, has been illustrated in this letter and how that, uh, that needs to take place in our life. But first of all, let's just deal with this Scripture in itself so we can understand some things that it means. And uh, I think sometimes this Scripture has been quoted so often, but has really so little been practiced. And so, uh, or at least I should say understood and, and made to have a practical application in our life. But God doesn't put anything in that Bible just to entertain you. God doesn't put anything in that Word just so you can have a story to tell your children at night. It's in that Word. He talks about in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 when He talked about things that happened to the Israelites. He said, these things happen unto them for our example. These are our examples that we should not lust after evil things as, as they also lusted. And so God writes these things down for our benefit, for our good, for our learning, for our living. It is a practical application in that verse of Scripture. And that's what we ultimately want to get to here. But you cannot get to the practice unless you understand the doctrine. If you don't understand the principle, you'll not make a good application of the principle. Paul always expressed doctrine, and then he took that doctrine and applied it, and made it a practical application to the life. And sometimes people have applied the Scripture without truly knowing the principle that was in the Scripture. And that ultimately leads to uh, uh, wrong actions and wrong attitudes. So let's take a look at just some simple things and what this verse says. Verse 7, Be not deceived. The tense of the 
the verb form as I understand this in this uh, phrase here, be not deceived, is literally the idea of stop deceiving yourselves. Don't go on being deceived. The idea is that they have already deceived themselves. Sometimes uh, we don't realize it, but a measure of self-deception has already taken place in our life because we've already started down a road we shouldn't be on it. Now, when we know as Christians uh, we can't violate the conscience, we know that we have to have a justification for what we do. There has to be a reason. There has to be some kind of righteousness behind what we do. Or we know we're in sin. So we have to seek a justification. We have to find a, 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 some kind of righteous reasoning to support our action and our activity. And this church is not any exception to the rule. They have taken a wrong road. Matter of fact, it's quite amazing. When you read it, if you flip back to the first chapter, how, how it comes. Paul normally, when he, uh, and this is the only exception, he writes to several churches in Galatia, not just one, but several churches. And, uh, and, and, and he writes to them, he, he introduces himself in order to establish his authority and where this letter is coming from. He sends grace unto them from God the Father. And, and uh, Jesus Christ the Lord in verse 3 and 4 and what He did and to Him be the glory. But normally in all the other letters there's a commendation. He commends them for something. This I'm praying for you. Or, or this and that. But to this church it's right straight to the point. It's right straight to a condemnation. In verse 6, I marvel. I marvel that you were so soon removed from Him that called you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel. This church has bought into another gospel. This church church has been removed from the position that they were in Christ and Paul is travailing in birth again until Christ is formed in them and he makes that statement over in chapter 4. He talks about in chapter 4 and verse 19, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. And that's the case with this church. So there's no commendation here. There's no, I'm glad for what God's doing in your midst. There's no, uh, I've been praying and you've been mentioned in my prayers. Uh, there is this immediately straight to the point. How could you folks uh, so quickly leave the gospel that was preached to you? How could you leave that place of faith? How could you leave that place of freedom? How could you leave that place of fruit bearing uh, and go away and turn to another gospel? And he makes that declaration and says uh, that if there's a man who comes and brings another gospel that I haven't preached, I don't care if it's an angel, that would condemn the Mormons. Uh, I don't care if it's a man uh, or some other doctrine, that would condemn Jehovah's Witness. Uh, if it's another gospel, if it takes us away from the fruit, uh, if it takes us away from faith in Christ, uh, if it draws us back to an Old Testament lifestyle instead of a New Testament lifestyle, if it draws us back to Sinai instead of the New Jerusalem, if it draws us back uh, to a ceremonial law instead of liberty of Jesus Christ. If it draws us to a life uh, that is dependent on human effort uh, instead of the power of the Spirit of God. Uh, away with it, he said. Uh, it's a false gospel and it's not true uh, and it should not be supported by the people of God. So this idea is, is that they had deceived themselves. They don't profess to have left the gospel. They don't think themselves to be wrong. But they are wrong, and they have missed it. These were genuine Christians, genuine believers, spirit-filled people. Because he mentioned later in chapter 5, I believe it was, or chapter 3, received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. They've received the Spirit. That means they were Pentecostal people. They've been filled with the Holy Ghost. They've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, spoken of the tongues. Uh, these churches were probably established on that first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas through, through the, the area of Galatia and in places where Timothy has come from. But now the Judaizers have come in and drawn them back to trusting uh, the works and the ceremony and the observance of the law rather than trusting Jesus Christ. Depending on their own energy to live right instead of depending on the Holy Ghost to live right. Uh, trusting uh, in their outward form uh, and trusting in their external ceremony rather than trusting uh, in Jesus Christ to be formed in them and to do His work in their life. It has resulted in the works of the flesh uh, instead of the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, and Paul comes to them and says, stop deceiving yourselves. Uh, be not deceived. Quit 
thinking this way. Don't go on deceiving yourself. God is not mocked. In other words, Paul said that you need to quit fooling yourself. God will be nobody's fool. God will be nobody's clown. He will be the brunt of nobody's joke. The tables will not be turned on him. He's not going to be made to look like an idiot. No, it will not happen. Whatever God says is going to happen. Whatever God says, whatever man soweth, that shall he also reap. You will not make a fool out of God. He's not mocked. So he says, whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. It's true in the natural world. It's true in the spiritual realm. It's true in the moral realm. I don't care what realm you put it in. It's true. Whatever seed goes in the ground is whatever fruit comes out of the ground. And that never, ever, ever changes in whatever realm we put it in, whether it's natural, physical, spiritual, it moral, it doesn't make any difference. Social, whatever it is, economic, it doesn't make whatever realm you put it in. If you sow, whatever you sow, whatever the nature is of the seed that you're placed in that soil, whatever nature is in that soil and in that seed and the elements working together is going to produce a crop that is true to the nature of the seed that you have sown. And therefore he says, if you sow to your flesh, he talks about that if any man soweth to his flesh, that indicates something, that there is a sowing that a man can do to his flesh, and he can plant, and as he can gratify that flesh, he can spend time on it, he can dedicate himself to it, he can give himself to pleasing it, he can give himself to gratifying a wish and an evil desire. He can give himself to satisfying his feelings and his emotions. But I'm telling you, what he reaps is going to be directly related to what he sows. I'm going to tell you, and he said, what you're going to sow is corruption. Flesh is dying. Flesh has got nothing good to offer us. Flesh has got no value. It's enmity against God, the carnal mind is. And the Bible says that they that are in the flesh cannot. It didn't say they simply will not. They cannot please God. It simply cannot be. We'll, we're dealing with that uh, principle as well in our Wednesday night Bible studies. But here he talks about that that man that sows his flesh. We've seen it. I'm going to deal with it in the context. But this morning I just want to deal with this passage a little bit. But we've seen it in the world. It doesn't matter where you go. You, we've seen it men. They, they sowed their seeds. We've seen it of some of the gross acts of sin in our culture and our society. We've seen as men have given themselves over to perverted sexual relationships. We have watched the diseases. We have watched in this country as we have become more permissive with our bodies. We have been abandoned by the Lord God and God's given men over to work what's unseemly and what is wrong and contrary to the Word of God. And in their bodies they've reaped a just recompense. We've seen sexually transmitted diseases out of skyrocket and all kinds of new diseases coming under this world. We have watched in America as America has given itself over. Yes, and, and well, we've given ourselves over to become folks who are just consumed with food. And we've watched it. It's had a detrimental effect upon our bodies and upon the health of this nation. You can't get around that. That's just the way it is. We've sown in our economy to corruption and greed and the big business. And I'm telling you, we're reaping it today. We've sown dependency upon the government. We've sown big government. And we're reaping the results of it. It's not brought morality. It's not brought greatness. Wherever we have sown wrong seed, we have reaped a harvest of corruption and immorality. You never get a bad crop from a good sowing. No, you don't get a good crop from a bad sowing. It doesn't work that way. No, sir. But nevertheless... This is exactly what has taken place. And he said, so we've seen it in that physical realm. We've watched it in the moral realm. We've watched it in the economical and social realm of our nation. In the spiritual realm, we've watched it as well. We've seen men. We've seen churches today that cater unto the flesh. Their whole idea is to gratify people. They promise you uh, 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 the same heaven. They promise you the same results and the same fellowship with God without a commitment and a dedication to the cross. There's no devotion 
transition to a life of separation from the world. You can live like the world, act like the world, look like the world, think like the world, be like the world. But as long as you got your ticket to heaven, you're good. As long as you can claim to add Jesus to your life, sing a little bit about Him. Add Him to your song. Put Him in your worship service. Talk about Him on the job and everything's all right. You don't have to conform to His image. All you got to do is just come in and so they cater. And folks are able to keep all the carnal practices. They're able to keep all their carnal passions. They're able to live their own carnal lifestyle and still have the hope of eternal life. I'm telling you, but in the church we're filled with divorce, we're filled with fornication, we're filled with immorality, we're filled with greed, we're filled with division and corruption. And it hasn't come because we've sowed the holy seeds of God's Word. We've sown to the flesh and we're reaping a harvest of corruption in the church world. We're not having an in, in effect upon our culture in a positive sense. We're not able to stem the tide of homosexuality. And we're thinking what we need are more protesters. No, what we need are more people that will live right. We think what we need is to get a million man march. And we'll just march on Washington. We can turn things around. No, I'll tell you what would be better is get a million men that would stand up and start living holiness and preaching it and declaring it. And go on their jobs and live right. Preachers would get in their pulpits and downgrade sin. And get in their pulpits and they would declare a, 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 a message of condemnation against the wicked practices of this world and the, and the transgressions of God's law. And that would stem the tide. That would let America's uh, 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 people know I would let the streets know, look, um, the church is not here to gratify you. The church is not here to find the way to build a crowd and get you into its audience. Uh, the church is here to show you the way of life uh, and to condemn the way of sin uh, and to preach the way of Jesus Christ. We're here to be salt uh, and we're here to be light. Uh, and when you turn light on, uh, when folks are in the dark, it hurts sometimes. Uh, and the eyes are tough to get used to it. But we don't have much light. Uh, we've sown to the flesh and we're reaping corruption. Amen. But then he says, he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. But sow into the Spirit again. I'm going to deal with it in its context and some of those practical things. But again, just let me try to summarize and just try to drive the point home a little bit. Our life consists, I don't really see another option here. There is no third option. Suggestion or option that's given to us is not he that sowed to the flesh and he that sowed to the spirit and he that sowed to something else. The indication from the verse and all throughout this epistle that Paul has written is that it's either flesh or spirit. You are sowing, you are planting, and you are reaping. And you are reaping what you are sowing. Oh, but the woods have got this and this and that. And that, you know, you're saying now, but oh, I didn't say anything. I'm just telling you what the Bible indicates to us. Me, I'm reaping what I have sown and what I'm sowing. That's it. You are too. I'm telling you, I've reaped some things. I've sold some bad things out there. And I've reaped some corruption. But I've sown some to the Spirit as well. And I have reaped life everlasting. I'm telling you, there's only two places. You're a planter. You're a farmer in this life. You're, you are here. You're here to build a crop. You're here to build a life. You're here as the field of God's handiwork. And please let it be known that whatever you're doing in your life, you are either catering to the flesh or you're catering to the Holy Spirit. You're getting stronger or you're getting weaker. You're getting closer to God or you're getting further away. You're becoming more endeared to Him or you're becoming more distant to Him. There might be a space of time where you hang a little bit in limbo, but you can't straddle for long. It's time to plant. you got to choose. You can't be neutral to the truth. you got to cast a vote. you got to cast a joy. A full, what is it? Am I going forward? Am I going backward? Am I going to move on for Jesus? Or am I going to go back to the world? You've got to make the decision. And we do it. We do it all the time. I do it. I come to dilemmas in my life. I get to situations. i I got to decide which way am I going to go. can't sit here and hang myself forever. I'm moving on for Jesus Christ. Every one of us do that. It's just sowing to the Spirit. Sowing to the Spirit. We've seen it. What have you given the Spirit to work with? What have you laid in the field, field of the Spirit? What seeds have you placed there to give Him to produce a harvest in your life? 
What communion have you spent with Him? How have you prayed and talked with God so that God can talk with you? How have you read and applied the Scripture in your life so the Spirit can do something with it? Woo! Our prayers don't do anything. Our prayers are doing more than you think they are. We've been studying in Revelation in our Hispanic on Thursday night. And I'm telling you, read it again. This week it's read, in, uh, I think it's in Revelation chapter 5. And then later on, we see it again coming. In Revelation, I believe it's in chapter 10, uh, chapter 8, 9, and 10. It deals with it in, the, in those contexts and talks about it. Whenever this judgment is coming upon this world, whenever those angels are going to sound those trumpets, uh, before they get ready to sound those trumpets, uh, there's one that takes some incense uh, and puts it on that altar in heaven uh, and offers it up with the prayers of the saints. Uh, oh, glory to the Lamb of God. Uh, you may think sometimes God's not answering us. Uh, we cry for deliverance from the oppression of this world. We cry for God to do something and bring judgment upon this world and bring His righteousness to bear upon the lives of people. There will be a host of people that will be saved in the tribulation and it may just take it. It may just take the tribulation. But I'm telling you, when He brings it, all the prayers of the saints are coming up in His face as it brings judgment upon this world and He turns hearts back to Him and He turns Israel back to Him and a host of Gentiles are converted to Jesus Christ because God is God and God will bring to pass what he has said he will do what have you done you know a man can't expect to reap a harvest of the anointing of the spirit in a pulpit if he hadn't studied and prayed if he hadn't given God something to work with you want to reap a harvest from a church service what did you put into it Amen. I mean, let's just, let's just understand something. There's a sowing. There's a planning. There's something on my part. I'm the sower in this. We're not talking about Jesus sowing. Talk about me sowing. He that soweth to His flesh. He that soweth to the Spirit. This is something you do in your life. This is anything God does for you. It's in something that God does with you. You do it. I've got to take it and invest energy somewhere. I've got to put something into my life. I've got to let something come, whether it's by a book, whether it's by, by, by a CD, whether it's by a video, something into that window that the Holy the ghost can use and bring a harvest in my life. i got to listen somewhere to the preaching of God's Word. i got to sing a song of Zion. i got to dig in that book. i got to get on my knees. i got to do something where I can sow and then the Holy Ghost can take it and produce in me a harvest of life and a harvest of joy and righteousness. What, what He wants to produce is a life. He said, what you reap from the Spirit is eternal life. Now let's just, I want to try. Let me just, this isn't complicated preaching. I'm not bringing anything new to you this morning. But life. If you were to gauge right now the quality of life that you have, and let's not talk about our physical condition, all right? Real quality of life is not based on health. And then, you know, there have been some folks... Paul and Silas at the bottom of a Philippian jail. Bloody, hurting, aching, beating. Were miserable physically. Uncomfortable. I mean, just terrible condition. But when the earthquake comes, they aren't calling for the Greek gods. They're not reaching out to find the magistrates. They didn't go down to look for the sorcerers and those who were witches and those who were calling upon their gods. They looked down to those fellows in the jail cell. Said, there, they've got something. The rich man came. He had his wealth. He had his health. He had his good things. But he came and bowed before that peasant, Jesus Christ, and said, Good master, what must I do that I might have eternal life? Life is not bound up in your bank account. Life is not bound up in the health of your body. It's a quality of existence that goes beyond the material and reaches down to the state that's in a man's mind and his heart and his soul. The peace and tranquility and the joy that can be inwardly sustaining that man in the midst of his physical dilemmas and problems. And if I ask you right now, has there been in you an increased 
harvest of life. Are you reaping misery, confusion, heartache, tumult, chaos, discord, lack of peace, joylessness, enmity, bitterness, envy, malice, hatred? Is that there? Or can you say, joy's on the rise, love's been growing, peace is there. I'm becoming more temperate and not less temperate. Amen. Discipline is growing in my life. Meekness. I've been able to surrender my rights. I'm able to succumb and submit to authority better than I used to. More humble than I used to. I'm able to trust God in difficult circumstances. Righteousness. Peace. Love, joy, peace. Long-suffering. I've become more supportive and be able to be more patient with people than less. I've been able to more easily forgive the wrongs and the offenses of others around me. I'm talking about a quality of life that money cannot purchase. I'm talking about when he says love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. I'm able to restrain myself more. I'm able to show a goodness to others. I'm able to help people who have hurt me. I'm able to pray for people for people who have, have criticized me and derided me and derailed me. I'm able to reach out and actually do good to a man who has manifested hatred and malice and enmity towards me. Can you say that in your life I'm getting an increase. I'm getting a growth. I haven't arrived, but I'm telling you, I'm further along than I wish to be. Why? I've been sowing. I've been planting. I've been giving the Holy Ghost something to work with. And He's working in my life. And I'm reaping a harvest of what God has done. Amen. Go ahead. Where's the harvest of life? Morality, not corruption. My marriage is getting stronger, Brother Woods. My leadership in my home is getting stronger, Brother Woods. My submission to my husband is getting better. I'm able to honor him when he's not honorable. Hello. I'm getting more faithful and not less. I'm able to go and do things now without my emotions running me and controlling me. But you don't get there by catering to your flesh. You don't get there by gratifying your feelings. You get there by sowing to the Holy Ghost. You get there by telling Him, I'm trusting you to work this in my life. I want you to know that you're the one that's got to produce this in me. I can't produce it in my own self. And you're crying out for God to fill you up daily with the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And you're trusting Jesus and you let Him know that you're the one that's going to do this. I'm praying for you to be formed in me. I want you to take my personality and I I want you to be formed in me. I'm Dan Woods, and I'm going to be the mold here. I'm going to be the one. I want Jesus poured into me so that out of everything that I, that Jesus shapes Himself in me and using my personality, He be able to reflect His image and His character. So Paul said, I'm praying that Christ can be formed in you. That means you're the mold. And He is formed in you. That is, we want to see what Jesus looks like when he's black, when he's Ross Jackson, and he's married to Samantha, and he's got that beautiful baby, and he's called to preach on a gospel campus, or not a gospel campus, preach the gospel on a campus. And he sits in this church, and he sits under this leadership, and he sits on that pew, and he's got this job, and he's got this station. What's Christ going to look like when he's working in that body? What's he going to look like when he's got those gifts? When he's got that background? When he's got that kind of calling and that kind of duty and that kind of wife and that kind of baby and that kind of church? What's he going to do about it? How's he going to live? Here's the mold, Ross Jackson. Here's the mold, Samantha Jackson. Here's the mold, Steve Mitchell. And what we want is we want a Steve Mitchell that is filled with Christ. We want a Steve Mitchell that's got Christ oozing out of him in every place. And so that all that Steve Mitchell does is what Jesus Jesus would do if Jesus was Steve Mitchell so that he's formed in him. Sometimes, sometimes we wonder why things don't get better. Sometimes we wonder why our peace does not increase. 
We wonder why our joy does not increase. We wonder why we still battle with our love. We wonder why we're still struggling with being able to submit. We wonder why we're still struggling with being able to be temperate and discipline our bodies. We wonder why we're struggling with being faithful. We wonder why our peace is not what it ought to be. And, and we, we struggle with it and we, we really want things to get better. But in all reality, they never change or they, or they, they don't seem to improve. Just battle, battle, battle and there's a reason. You're sowing to the wrong place. And you keep fighting that corruption. You keep fighting that downward path. One day it'll get a hold of you. And you, you try to move up, but you're not moving up. You try for things to be better, but they don't seem to get better. They seem to grow worse. You seem to have less peace instead of more peace. Less joy instead of more joy. Why? Because you're sowing and planting in the wrong field. You need to get out of the field you're in. And you need to travel across the way and get you another field. Where the Holy Ghost is. Hallelujah. And sow there. Sow in that field. Plant in that field. And you'll reap a harvest like you you've never had before in your life. God will always give you back more. You'll be amazed how far even a little prayer and communion will go in your life. Amen. You always reap more than you sow. Always. And sometimes with even the little time that's spent in the Word and spent in prayer, it's amazing how gracious God is to give us such a harvest over the little effort sometimes that we have put forth into the work and in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. We've sown a few kernels and got a stock full of ears of corn. Hallelujah. And I wonder, what can God do next week, Brother John, if we'll get on our face and say, God, I want revival. I want revival. I want revival. I want revival. Hallelujah. I want life in this church. Again. Woo! Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is not a fairy tale. This is Bible. Reaping time comes. He said, For you shall reap. He tells us, verse 9, tells us now, let us not be weary in well-doing. Right. Hmm. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Have you ever noticed in our world the opposition that you experience when you simply try to do the right thing? You wasn't trying to get mean on anybody. You were earnestly with all of your heart. You sought to do what was right. And don't you know you had more opposition than you figured on. It might even come sometimes from within the church. You had a good intention. You had a good deed. You did a good thing. You did it out of your heart. But somebody misinterpreted what you did. And your temptation is, what's the use? Throw your hands in the air and quit and say, what the use? Never a farmer was successful when he went out there and planted. And sometimes it didn't go up as fruitful as it wanted. But you know what it did? He fertilized it. Hallelujah. He went back there and labored and he put some more effort into it. He never get a harvest by lowering up his hands and sitting on his porch and rocking away the rest of the years in a rocking chair. He'll never see a harvest. He's got to get the plow out again. He's got to get the seed back out again. He's got to pray for rain again. But I'm telling you, if you labor, there will be a harvest. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. 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 Let's not be weary. Tired. Feeling like giving up. Exhausted. Just give up. Give in. Give out. Yeah. Yeah. He said, in well 
doing. That's it. You see, it takes time to sow to the Spirit. There's one thing I've understood about the process of sowing and reaping. It's not a fast process. And I'm going to tell you something. The more we've tried to hurry that process in the natural realm, the more we've wrought corruption instead of good things. We pump the steroids into our animals. We bred all kind of hybrid crops that grow faster and quicker. So we can get it twice instead of once a year. And I'm telling you, it's killing us. Now everything, I don't even know if I know what gluten is. I've read about it. Am I going to worry about it? No. I'm going to keep praying over my food. And I'm going to keep eating. And if I die, I'm going to glory. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. I ain't getting all worried about that and taking every piece of bread and every piece of meat and locking a cow up in my backyard. I'm not going to do it. If you want to, have at it. But don't put it on me because I ain't doing it. It ain't got anything to do with your salvation either. Glory to God. You can be a gluten-free Christian. You can be a gluten-full Christian. Whichever one you want to be. The kingdom of God's not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. What I am going to do, we spent so much time so into that flesh, worrying about our body when our soul is so famished and we're losing out. Let's give it to God that soul to the Spirit and reap a harvest. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. My point is, is you don't help things by trying to hurry them along. You generally make this issue worse. Sometimes nature has to take a course. Sometimes there's a path that's got to be done, but sow it. And don't look for the harvest the next day. But when you get up, get up in hope. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> and you might sometimes go out. I expected to see it break through the ground today. I expected to see a little bit of result today. But you know what? I didn't see it, but I tell you what I'm going to do. I have sown. I have planted. I have fertilized. I have cultivated. I've done all I know to do. I'm trusting the Holy Ghost to bring a harvest. Oh, glory to God. And you can know something that when you come out one day, I didn't see it today, but I'll get up tomorrow morning in hope and I'll walk out on that field again and I'm looking for a harvest. Maybe I didn't see an outpouring of the Spirit today, but I'll see it next week. I'll see it tomorrow. I'll see it. Why? Because I've sown a harvest. I planted a crop. What do you got to do? You got to keep doing well. You can't become a lazy farmer. You can't become a pessimistic farmer. Well, it ain't going to rain. Well, it ain't going to, this is going to happen. Well, it can't happen today. Man, with men it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. Right. Where'd you sow? Did you sow to humanistic efforts? Did you sow to your dependency on men? That's why you can't expect the harvest. Because you're looking for your harvest to come from the preacher. You're looking for your harvest to come from your husband. You're looking for your harvest to come from your wife. You're looking for your harvest to come from your children. It don't come. You've sown to the flesh. You're going to get corruption. You trust me and you're going to fail. you got to sow to the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. you got to sow your seed in Him. I'm trusting you to bring revival. I'm trusting you to anoint the preacher. I'm trusting you to feed me on Sunday morning. I'm trusting you, God, to produce in me more love, joy, peace, long-suffering, generous. Goodness, meekness, and faith, and temperance. Thank you, Jesus. Just keep going back and doing the right thing. Don't get tired of doing it. Many a farmer got up that same early hour, went out there, had to milk those cows. He had to go out there and work in that field. He got tired. He got weary. I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes it gets monotonous. Mm -hmm. Sowing is not really exciting work. 
it gets monotonous, it gets boring sometimes, it gets routine. But stick with the routine. It's all right. I'm going to be up there every morning. I'm going to seek God. I'm going to be in that book. I'm going to be faithful to church. Because I know one thing. The service I miss is going to be the service He falls. Sure enough. That week that farmer goes out on vacation is the week the harvest is going to come in. Sure enough, you know it's going to happen. No, I'm just going to do well. Well, it seems like everything I do, people don't appreciate it. People don't like it. I can't seem to do anything right. Who are you trying to please, man or God? Just ask yourself one thing. Am I so into the Spirit. Have I done what He wants me to do? Have I taken this temple and yielded it up as a living sacrifice and presented it holy and acceptable one to God? That's my service. And I want to harvest back from what I've given. Hallelujah. Come on. Yes, sir. What's my harvest? It ain't money. Yeah. It's not really even health. It's life. I'm not asking God to take away my trials. I'm asking Him to make me more gracious in my trials. I'm not asking God to give me a smooth road. I'm asking Him to give me some callous feet and I can keep walking on this road. Hallelujah. I'm not asking Him to take every mountain out of my life. I'm asking Him to give me strength to climb them. Glory to God. So when I reach a top, and you might feel like sometimes, I heard a man say recently, you might feel like sometimes you're on an island and nobody cares where you're at. But I can tell you what an island is. An island is nothing more than a mountaintop showing its top sticking up out of the bottom of an ocean. And you may be on an island, but you're on top of the mountain, glory to the love of God. And if God is with you, then lift up your hands. A harvest is going to come in due season. It won't come when you want it, but when it's ready, when it's ripe, when it's time, God's going to bring the harvest to your life. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb of God. In due season. In due season. When it's ready. When it's time. There's something that we sometimes we apply here in the good, but we don't realize that it's also true on the other side of the fence. We see those churches, you hear me carefully, and we know there's things there that's wrong, but they're prospering. They're sowing to the flesh. But they're prospering. The crowds are growing. They talk about conversions. Their mission outreach is growing. My wife just told me about a woman, a widow we knew in Elkins, West Virginia. She died, left her whole estate, Joel Osteen. What a waste. You don't even know him. You're spending two minutes with the guy. And leave your resources to a ministry unproven. Come on. That you ain't even been a part of. Can't even measure it. But here's our problem. We forget. Even the harvest from the flesh comes in due season. It doesn't come overnight. Now, you don't sow to the flesh today and reap all that corruption tomorrow. You'll reap some joy for a while. You'll reap some good times for a while. It'll seem like everything's going good. But then a day will come that harvest time will come in. There'll be a day that the ship comes into port. Come on now. There'll be a day that it comes time to pay the fiddler. Yes, sir. And then we'll see. Then when the health is broken. Then when all that corruption you've shown has now, and you look out across that congregation, you ain't got enough spirituality in it to save a mouse. You ain't got enough of God that place uh, to even face the devil let alone cast one out. Uh, you ain't got enough of God in that place to overcome the smallest temptation. And when America goes down the tubes, uh, that same crowd that's dependent on money, they'll be clamoring and climbing and crying uh, and scratching uh, for every little thing they can get uh, instead of going to the God that always supplies our needs. Uh, instead of going to the one that provides the harvest. Uh, I'm telling you, it may be tough going now, but if we'll sow to the Spirit, Brother John, we're going to have a harvest. We're going to have a harvest. Uh, we're going to have a harvest, hallelujah. And it's going to be a good one, praise the Lord. Woo! Come on, stand to your feet. Go into the Lamb of God and give it praise. Hallelujah! 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 Hallelujah!
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Saints of God, I'm going to tell you something right here this morning. The harvest of life that is an increase of joy that I mentioned earlier in those nine fruit to the Spirit. That's life. That's life. Yeah. Love. Yeah. Ah, if you've got love, you've got life. Right. Woo. Right. Man, when you can reach out and do good to people that have wronged you, you've got something. You've got something the world ain't got. I'm telling you. Man, when you can come to church with a passion, burning for Jesus Christ, when everything's went wrong in your life, that's something the world don't have. Their passion goes up and down based on their circumstances, based on their emotions and their feelings. But when you've got love and it's God's love, you've got life, church. When you've got joy, I'm telling you, you've got an inward vitality that makes you be able to smile in the midst of difficulty times. you got something the world doesn't have. Jesus said, my joy I give unto you. My peace I give unto you. Hallelujah. These things I've written that your joy might be fulfilled. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, when you've got peace in the midst of difficulty, you've got life. When you've got self-denial and temperance in your body, faithfulness, you've got something. You've got something. And you're not doing it so you can win a gold medal at the Olympics. You're not doing it so NBC can pastor you as their, as their poster boy all over the world. Let me tell you, when you can do it, and it seems you don't even get an earthly reward out of it, you can do it and it don't seem like nobody notices and you don't get an increase in your bank account on it. Only thing you get out of it is closer to the cross. Woo! Hallelujah. What you get out of it is more of Jesus. More of Jesus. Less of you and more of Jesus. You've got something. You've got life, brother. Amen. Gentleness, real goodness, meekness, the ability to surrender your rights. We think we ought to be more aggressive. I ought to be able to show folks my stuff. I ought to be able to tell them, hey, I'm the one in charge here. Man, when you can show more meekness, when you can show more servant's attitude, you've got something this world don't have, my friend. You've got life. You've got life. <laughs> and it's the contingent on two things. Number one, you got to sow. You ain't going to get it unless you sow. God's going to put it in you when you're saved. But you got to sow to it if you want a heart and increase it. If you want it to grow in your life, you got to plant some seeds. Woo, hallelujah. And the second thing it contingent on is faithfulness and well doing. You can't lose heart. You can't quit. You can't give up when it looks bad, when you're tired, when you want to, when you want to lose heart, when you become like it's hopeless, when you feel like you're not getting anywhere, when you don't see any results, when it looks like the harvest didn't come. You got to keep working anyway. You got to keep sowing. You got to keep planting. You got to keep plowing. You got to keep cultivating. You got to keep doing what God says to do because my friend let us not be weary and well doing for in due season in due season if it's not this year it's next year I don't determine the season I determine the sowing I determine the labor but I don't determine the harvest God will determine that in due season in due season in due season in due season season. season. hallelujah you will reap you will reap if you don't give up if you don't quit, if 
you don't shut it down, if you don't become disheartened, if you don't leave out your reap. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Come on, church, and give it praise. My, why don't you lift his name up today? He 